In the year 1676, a poor tinker named John Bunyan was imprisoned in Bedford Jail. While he was there, he started to write one of the most famous books in the English language. And everything is told as if it happened in a dream. I dreamed, he says, that I saw a man with a book in his hand and a great burden on his back. As he read the book, he began to weep. Then, in a lamentable voice, he cried out, What shall I do to be saved? For he lived in the city of destruction, which he learnt from his book was doomed to be burnt with fire from heaven, and everyone who lived there would perish in the flames. So Christian, for that was his name, went home, to talk to his wife and children. Oh, my dear wife, he said, and you, the children of my loins, I've tried to keep this from you as long as I could. But it says in this book, we shall all come to ruin unless we find a way of escape. They thought some kind of madness had got into the poor man. And as it was drawing towards night, they hoped that sleep might settle his brains, and with all haste, they put him to bed. But the night was to him as troublesome as the day. So, when morning was come, and they asked him how he was, he told them, Worse! Worse! His children were bewildered, his relatives incensed. They tried chiding him and deriding him. Finally, they thought it best to take no notice. So, Christian went by himself into the fields, still reading his book and carrying his burden. No one would listen to his warning, and he didn't know where to turn. Then, in the distance, he saw a man approaching. His name was Evangelist, and he greeted him kindly. Hmm, what are you weeping for? he asked. Sir, he answered, this book in my hand tells me to flee from the wrath to come. Also, I need to get rid of this burden, which is on my back. I fear that it will sink me lower than the grave. Then Evangelist pointed with his finger across the plain. Do you see yonder wicket gate? He asked. No, said Christian. Then do you see a shining light? He said, I think I do. Then said Evangelist, keep that light in your eye and go in that direction, so you shall reach the gate. Then, when you knock, you'll be told what to do. Without delay, Christian began to run. His wife and children saw him running. They wondered, was he gone for good? And called after him to return. The neighbours also came out to see him run, and two of them resolved to bring him back by force. Soon, they overtook him. The name of the one was Obstinate. The name of the other was Pliable. And at first, Christian tried to persuade them to go along with him. What? said Obstinate and leave our friends and our comforts behind us. Yes, said Christian, for I am going to a kingdom where we shall live forever. Read of it, if you will, in my book. Tush, said Obstinate. 
Away with your book. Hey, will you go back with us, or no? No, not I, said Christian. Then said Pliable, If what Christian says is true, I intend to go with this good man. For myself, said Obstinate. I will be no companion to such fantastical fellows. I'll go back to my own house. So they parted. Obstinate went back, and Christian and Pliable went on over the plain. Tell me more, said Pliable, about the place to which we are going. There are crowns of glory to be given us, said Christian, and garments shining like the sun. And he who owns that place will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Oh, oh, come then, my good companion, let us hurry, said Pliable. I can't go any faster, said Christian. I've got this heavy burden. As they were talking together, they had drawn near to a miry slough, which was called the Slough of Despond. It was a place where many travellers before them had been drowned. And not looking where they were going, they both suddenly fell into the bog. Here they wallowed, grievously bedaubed with filth and scum. Nor did the weight of Christian's burden help him. Indeed, he was sinking fast. Pliable, being unburdened, managed in the end to scramble back. But he was very angry. Is this the happiness you promised me? He asked. If we have such trouble at the start, what may we expect at the finish? And he ran off home for a hot bath, leaving Christian to struggle on his own. He had quite given himself up for lost when he heard someone shouting to him from the further side. His name was Help. He told him there were stepping stones just below the surface of the mud and he directed him to them. You see, that's the hazard of this place, he said. It so spews out its filth that at the changes of the weather these steps are hardly seen. So Help gave him his hand and drew him out and set him upon firm ground again. And Christian continued on his way towards the wicket gate. Although he didn't know it, more trouble awaited him. <coughs> For a certain Mr. Worldly Wiseman was the next to meet him. A very inquisitive and self-important gentleman who dwelt in the town of Carnal Policy, hard by where Christian lived. Mm. You don't mind my asking, he said. Have you a wife and children? Why, yes, replied Christian. But I'm so laden with this burden that I, I can't take pleasure in them any more. Who counseled you to start on this journey? A stranger called Evangelist. Ah, I thought so. There's no one more dangerous. He's always misleading travellers. I'm older than you. Let me give you some advice, my good fellow. In yonder village, there dwells a gentleman whose name is Legality. A very judicious man, a man of very good name. He has skill to help men off with their burdens. He has, to my knowledge, cured several who were going out of their wits because of them. Moreover, there are houses standing empty in the village at reasonable rents. The food is cheap and good, and you can send for your wife and children, and all live happily together. Christian was, I fear, all too ready to listen to this Mr. Worldly Wiseman, who now proceeded most courteously 
to direct him away from his right road. Oh, do you see yonder hill? Yes, very well. By that hill you must go. And the first house you come to is Mr. Legality's. Christian shouldn't have listened to him. For what he had failed to tell him was that the hill ahead was a fearsome mountain. It towered above him, as if about to crush him. Worse than that, there were flashes of fire coming out of it. And Christian, because of his burden, might easily have fallen, and thus early on his journey have been burnt to death. Wherefore he did sweat and quake for fear. At that moment, who should appear but Evangelist, with a severe and dreadful countenance. Aren't you the man I found weeping outside the city of destruction? Yes, dear sir, I am the man, said Christian, blushing for shame. And didn't I direct you to the little wicket gate? Yes, dear sir. How then is it that you've so quickly turned aside? When Christian had told his story, Evangelist said, You have rejected the word of God for the advice of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. But Mr. Legality cannot free you of your burden. Mr. Legality is a cheat. As he spoke, there was a great clap of thunder. And Christian called himself a thousand fools for listening to Mr. Worldly Wiseman. He turned back in haste and went like one who all the while was treading on forbidden ground. He couldn't wait to regain the road he had abandoned. But would he ever reach it? He wasn't at all sure. For narrow is the gate, it says in his book, and few are they who find it. Next time, we shall tell of Christian's strange visit to the interpreter's house. And learn whether or not he discovers a way of ridding himself of his burden. At the very start of his journey, Christian had already been in the slough of despond and strayed most foolishly from the straight and narrow path. But he had been warned, just in time, by his friend Evangelist, that his right road lay through a distant wicket gate. As he was hurrying along, he came across three men, fast asleep, with fetters on their heels. They were called Simple, Presumption and Sloth. Christian knew that to sleep on that particular road was like sleeping in the rigging of a ship when a storm was brewing. Wake up, he cried, and I will help you off with your irons. 
But they only opened one eye at him and yawned. I see no danger, said Simple. Oh, I want to go on sleeping, said Sloth. Every tub must stand on its own bottom, said Presumption. Then they all three rolled over and went to sleep again. So Christian proceeded on his way, troubled to think that men in such danger should so little esteem his kindness in waking them. We are now to learn how wise it was of Christian to warn them. For as he drew nearer the gate, he saw that it was firmly closed. And even as he reached it, he felt the wind of an arrow swish past his ear and bury itself in the woodwork. Looking round in terror, he now saw on the opposite hill a strong castle with a host of dark, menacing figures on the battlements. Christian didn't dally. He knocked with all his might. A second arrow narrowly missed him. Who's there? asked a voice. A poor burdened traveller. I come from the city of destruction and I'm going to the celestial city. <laughs> to his relief, the gate was quickly opened and a hand pulled him in. Then Christian asked the guardian of the gate, whose name was Goodwill, what mean these arrows? To which he answered, Yonder castle belongs to Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Both he and his soldiers will shoot their darts at anyone who tries to enter here. They aim to kill you before you reach safety. You are fortunate to be alive. Oh, I tremble and rejoice, said Christian. Why do you come alone? Because none of my neighbours and none whom I encountered on the road saw the danger. But I'm not one to talk. I also nearly turned aside, persuaded by the arguments of Mr. Worldly Wiseman. And I don't know what would have become of me had not Evangelist met me again when I was musing in the midst of my dumps. And, truth to tell, I'm still much inconvenienced by this burden. I just can't seem, however hard I try, <coughs> to get it off my back. Could you please help me off with it? No man can get it off for you, said Goodwill, but keep to the straight and narrow path and it will lead you to the place of deliverance. Oh, how long will that take? Christian asked himself as he girded up his loins and plodded on his way. His next stop was to be the house of the interpreter, who, Goodwill had told him, could give him useful lessons for his journey. It was a large and mysterious house, such as one visits in dreams. Its master, in answer to his knock, asked him what he wanted. Sir, said Christian, I'm here to seek your help.
Come in, said the interpreter, and I will show you a thing or two. First, he led him into a parlour, which was full of dust, because it was never swept. So the interpreter called for a serving maid to sweep it. But the dust began to fly, and Christian began to choke. <coughs> never had he seen such dust, and he groped around blindly. <coughs> Then he heard the interpreter telling the maid, Bring hither water and sprinkle the room. And all at once the dust had cleared, and the maid was sweeping it up with pleasure. This parlour, said the interpreter, is the soul of a man clogged with the dust of sin. But see how easily, by God's grace, it can be cleansed. Next, he led Christian into another dark room where there sat a man in an iron cage. He sat motionless, with his eyes looking downwards and his hands folded together. Who's this? asked Christian. Talk with him and see said the interpreter. I was once a flourishing professor, said the man, both in my own eyes and also in the eyes of others. I was on my way, as I thought, to the celestial city, and I was confident of getting there, but I failed to keep watch. I followed the pleasures of the world which proved to be an empty bubble. And now I'm shut up in this cage, a man of despair who can't get out. No further explanations were given. No one said who put him there. But the interpreter whispered to Christian, Bear well in mind what you have seen. Finally, Christian was led to a gateway, like the one which he had lately entered. Beside it sat a man at a table with a book and an inkhorn before him to take the name of anyone who wished to pass through. But the gate was guarded by fierce men in armour, ready to do to any traveller what hurt and mischief they could. And though there stood a great company of people desirous of going in, they didn't dare. Then, as it were a scene upon the stage, Christian saw a valiant man approach. Set down my name, sir, he said. That done, he drew his sword. And rushing at the gate, he went to work, cutting and hacking with such deadly force that he cut his way to safety. I think I know the lesson of this, said Christian triumphantly, as he resumed his journey. His safety would depend, it seemed, not on cleverness, but on simple courage. How his burden had got on his back in the first place, and why nobody else had burdens, as happens in dreams, we are not told. But never had he been so eager as he was now to be rid of it. And that, did he but know it, was half the battle. 
The road, from then on, was fenced on either side with a wall, and the wall was named Salvation. Along this road did burdened Christian run, or should we say he did his best to run, so far as he could, with that load upon his back. At the foot of the hill he passed an open tomb. Then, up again, upon a little knoll, he found himself beneath a wayside cross. And as its shadow fell across him, so suddenly the burden, slipping from off his shoulders, fell from off his back. It tumbled down the hill. It tumbled into the mouth of the tomb. It was never seen again. Christian kept feeling behind his back. He couldn't believe it. It was very surprising to him. And as he stood there in amazement, behold, three shining ones appeared. The first one said, your soul is now swept clean of sin. The second stripped him of his mud-stained rags and gave him bright new clothes. The third one handed him a parchment. Guard it carefully, he said, and surrender it only when you have reached the gate of the celestial city. Great dangers lay ahead of him, but for the moment he was light as air. So Christian gave three leaps for joy and went on singing. Next time we shall tell how Christian has to climb the hill difficulty and what great troubles are caused by his forgetfulness. We shall see if he'll evade the lions lying in wait for him. At the foot of a wayside cross, the burden, which had been such an encumbrance to Christian, had finally fallen from his back. He now set off again, free as a bird and light of foot, along the narrow way. Suddenly, to the left of him, Two strangers jumped over the wall and came at him apace. The name of the one was Formalist and the name of the other Hypocrisy. Gentlemen, asked Christian, where have you come from and where are you going? Well, we were born in the land of vainglory and are bound for the celestial city. Then why did you jump over the wall instead of coming through the wicket gate? It's too roundabout a way, they said. Our countrymen always take this shortcut. They've been doing it for hundreds of years, so it can't be wrong. Christian was dismayed. But it's breaking the rules of the journey. What's it matter how we did it, they said. If we're in, we're in. <laughs> and they went on their way, laughing. At last, they came to a crossroads. One broad road turned to the left. 
another broad road turned to the right while the narrow road went straight on up the great black back of the hill called difficulty which one would they choose formalist chose to go to the left which led him into a dark wood did he but know it the road was called danger and he lost his way forever hypocrisy chose to go to the right which led him into rough ground full of holes and hummocks did he but know it the road was called destruction here he stumbled and fell and rose no more Christian paused and drank at a spring to refresh himself then he started briskly straight on up the hill but soon he was wondering had he chosen wisely for he went from running to walking from walking to clambering and now he was on his hands and knees because of the steepness of the place then just as he was about to give up he espied a pleasant arbor which had been made by the Lord of the Hill for the refreshment of weary travelers here in the deep grass Christian gratefully lay down he pulled out the parchment which the angel had given him and read it for his comfort then in the drowsy warmth of the afternoon sun he fell asleep when he awoke it was late evening so he quickly rose up and hastened on his way then coming towards him he heard the sound of running feet and out of the twilight two men appeared the name of the one was Timorous and of the other Mistrust Sirs what's the matter asked Christian Timorous answered oh, oh, the further we go the more danger we meet yes said Mistrust for just ahead there lie two lions whether awake or asleep we know not but if we come within reach of them they could easily pull us to pieces so saying timorous and mistrust ran on down the hill leaving Christian much perplexed for he now said to himself if I go forward I shall perish likewise if I go back to my own country I shall perish what am I to do then he remembered his parchment and felt for it under his coat it had always been a help and comfort to him but though he he felt everywhere he couldn't find it he must have dropped it and it should have been his passport without which he couldn't enter the celestial city as so often happens in dreams that which he dreaded most had come to pass he had no choice he must go back so sighing deeply oh, chiding himself for being such a fool he retraced his steps looking on this side and on that it was growing darker all the time and the night was full of whispers 
and unearthly sounds. Dark though it was when he reached the arbour, God directed his eye to the place where the parchment lay. It must have slipped from him while he was asleep, and with great joy he picked it up. But then he cried, Oh dear, I have trod the same road three times, which I should have trod but once. How far might I have been by now upon my way? He truly feared that he would be benighted. There were those lions too. They seek their prey by night. If they should meet me in the dark, he said, how should I escape being torn into pieces? And again he asked himself, what shall I do? There was still light enough to read his parchment, and this is what he read. Desire now a better country, that is, the heavenly one. And with these words to strengthen him, Christian resumed his climb. And lifting up his eyes, he saw against the sky the towers of a stately palace, the palace beautiful. Here perhaps, he thought, they'll give me a lodging for the night. But before he could approach, he heard close by in the darkness the roaring of the lions. The only way forward was along a narrow passage, which was about a furlong from the porter's lodge. This, he knew, was the place from which Mistrust and Timorous had fled. And Christian was never so near to running back after them. But the porter at the lodge, whose name was Watchful, perceiving now that Christian made a halt, cried out, Fear not the lions, they're on long chains. If you keep strictly to the beam of light in the centre of the path, they cannot reach you. So Christian moved on. He took good heed to the directions of the porter. At the same time, he trembled for fear of the lions. For now, they were on either side of him, straining at their chains. And how they roared and snapped at him, and how they tried to catch him by the foot. But Christian soldiered boldly on, and in another minute he was through and had reached the gate unharmed. Then, somewhat breathlessly, he asked the porter, oh, Sir, may I lodge here for the night? That depends on the nature of your business, he said, looking at him suspiciously. For how does it happen that you come so late? The sun is set. When Christian had explained as best he could, the porter said, Well, that's a sorry tale, to be sure. But I will summon one of the young ladies that lives here. If she likes your talk, she may let you in, or, contrarywise, she may not. So, watchful, the porter rang the bell. And there appeared, at the sound of it, a grave and beautiful damsel called Discretion. She questioned him closely, asking him, what he had seen and met with in the way, and he told her, and she smiled, though tears stood in her eyes. 
Then, to his relief, she said, We have to be careful here whom we admit. But this house was built by the Lord of the Hill for the benefit of pilgrims. So, with the Lord's blessing, come in. And Christian they laid in a large upper chamber, whose window opened towards the sun rising. And the name of the chamber was Peace. So, for a little while, Christian was safe. And much he needed to renew his strength. For on the morrow, though he knew it not, he had to fight with Apollyon. <laughs> Next time, indeed, we shall tell of the fearful fight with Apollyon when the foul fiend comes out, determined to stop Christian from continuing his journey. And we shall discover who is the winner of the contest. previous day, Christian had climbed the hill difficulty and, after braving the lions which guarded the gate, found refuge in the Palace Beautiful. He had spent the best night of his journey and when morning was up, he was escorted to the roof by the four ladies of the house whose names were Charity, Piety, Prudence, and Discretion. For they told him he should not depart till they had shown him the rarities of the place. Look to the south, they said. And so he did, and saw in the distance the delectable mountains. From the crest of these mountains, they told him, you can see your first glimpse of the celestial city. Then the damsel called Charity said to Christian, Have you a family? Are you a married man? And he replied, I have a wife and four small children. Then why didn't you bring them along with you? to share in your felicity. At this, our traveller began to weep. <laughs> I would willingly have done so. But my wife was afraid of losing the comforts of this world. <laughs> and my children were given to the foolish delights of youth. <laughs> so what with one thing and another, <laughs> to my great grief, they would not come. From all that had befallen him so far, you may think he did prudently to make the journey first alone. The other damsels said as much. And though now he was eager to depart, they counselled him most earnestly to arm himself before he left the palace. The armory was full of curious weapons from the past. They showed him Moses' rod, and the jawbone of an ass, which Samson used against the Philistines, and the sling and stone, which David used to slay Goliath. And then, 
they fitted Christian out with the armour which their Lord provided for the use of travellers that they might stand their ground when things were at their worst. First, the helmet and the breastplate that could save his life. Then, the faithful shield to fend off the fiery darts of the wicked. Then the trusty sword that could cut through anything. Finally, his feet were shod with shoes that would never wear out. For he was setting forth, they said, not against human foes, but against the wiles of the devil. Thus, fully armed, did Christian hurry to the gate. Before he left, he asked the porter, had he noticed other travellers upon the road? There was one, said the porter. I asked him his name, and he told me it was Faithful. Good, said Christian. I know him well. He's my townsman, my near neighbour. He comes from the place where I was born. I will try to overtake him. He was not to overtake his friend that day. Instead, he found himself in a solitary valley called the Valley of Humiliation. Here, after he had stopped to partake of the bread and wine and raisins which the damsels had given him, he was feeling well enough content. All of a sudden, a darkness fell across the sun, and looking up, he saw, stalking towards him, the towering shape of a foul fiend. A monster, full three meters high. As happens in a dream, he recognized the fiend at once, and he knew his name. It was Apollyon. Terrified, he cast in his mind whether to go back or to stay firm. Then, considering that he'd no armor on his back, and to turn his back to his foe would give him the advantage, he resolved to stay firm. The fiend had now drawn very close. He had wings like a dragon. He had scales like a fish, and they are his prey. And out of his belly came fire and smoke. He looked upon Christian with a disdainful countenance. Where have you come from? He asked. I've come from the city of destruction, which is the place of all evil. <laughs> then I perceive you are one of my subjects. <laughs> For I am the prince of that city. Why then are you running away from your prince? <laughs> I was indeed born in your dominions, but I have given my allegiance to another who is the king of princes. And to tell you the truth, I like his service better than yours. I am the enemy of this king. I hate his person, his laws, and his people. <laughs> Give him the slip and work for me and your wages. <laughs> shall be doubled. 
but Christian knew that this was not the way to save his life. The wages that you give are not such as a man can live on. They are the wages of death. Then Apollyon broke into a grievous rage and shouted, What you say is true! Therefore, prepare yourself to die! Apollyon, beware what you're doing, Christian shouted back, for I am on the king's highway, the way of holiness. But Apollyon straddled the way and barred his path. I swear by my infernal den that you shall come no further. And without more ado, he threw a flaming dart at him. Christian luckily caught it on his shield. Thereafter, though, the fiend's darts came thick and fast. And though he did all he could to avoid them, and in spite of his new armour, Christian was wounded in the head, the hand, the foot, and forced to yield ground. The combat lasted more than half a day. The woods re-echoed with the clash of arms. You couldn't imagine, unless you had been there, what yelling and roaring Apollyon made and what sighs and groans burst from the pilgrim's heart. For you must know that, by reason of his wounds, Christian was growing weaker by the hour. <laughs> then Apollyon saw his chance and came in close. And wrestling with Christian gave him such a dreadful fall that his sword flew from his hand. <laughs> now I am sure of you! And kneeling on him as he lay helplessly upon his back, he pressed him near to death, then raised his arm to make an end of this good man. But at that moment, Christian cried, Rejoice not yet against me, O oh mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And Christian nimbly stretched his hand out for his sword and caught it up and ran Apollyon through. <laughs> and with a hideous roar, as one that had received a mortal wound, the fiend drew back. Then, for the first time, Christian smiled. For, looking up, he saw Apollyon spread his dragon's wings and fly away, dripping blood over the fields as he went. But Christian too was bleeding copiously. And if he were to bleed to death, his victory would have been in vain. So, in his mercy, God directed him towards a certain tree, the tree of life. The leaves of which he now applied to all his wounds. And rapidly they staunched the flow of blood. Then, thanking God for his deliverance, Christian went forward to the valley's end. He left his heavy armour there, but kept his sword still drawn in his hand. For all I know, he said, 
Some other enemy lies even now in wait for me. Indeed, far worse things lay ahead of him, worse even than his combat with the fiend. Next time, we shall tell how Christian, in the darkness and all alone, enters the dreaded valley of the shadow of death. And we shall find out why the valley has its evil name and reputation. Christian, after the fearsome fight with Apollyon, when he might have died of his wounds, had found healing under the tree of life. But it was only a brief respite. For as he continued on his journey, he now had to enter the darkest valley he had yet encountered, a very lonely place where there was no water no one ever lived there, and its silence was the silence of the grave. Here, Christian was to be more sternly tested than even in his fight with Apollyon. It all started when two men suddenly ran out from behind some trees, shouting, Back! Go back! Uh, why? What's the matter? asked Christian. Matter? said they. Why, the valley itself, it's as black as pitch down there, and the only sound is the howling of the damned, who, having entered there, have never been able to find their way out. In a word, it's every whit dreadful and utterly without order, for, we'd have you know, this is none other than the valley of the shadow of death. But, said Christian, there is no other way to the celestial city. It's not the way we're going, they said. Quick, go on, on, on. And they ran on, past Christian, waving their arms in terror. Christian, notwithstanding, went forward, sword in hand, feeling his way step by step, for the path was exceedingly narrow. On the right there lay a very deep ditch, into which many had fallen in all ages and perished miserably. On the left there lay a marsh so dangerous that even a good man if he was sucked in, was never seen again, for he could find no bottom for his foot to stand on. And it was all so dark that when Christian tried to avoid the marsh, he almost fell headlong into the ditch, and he never knew whether his next step might not be his last. Then he saw ahead of him the light of a fire burning, and for a moment, as one does in dreams, he thought the worst was over. Some light to see by! This is better! But he was utterly mistaken. For what he had seen was the very mouth of hell itself out of which were belching clouds of evil-smelling smoke, which added to the darkness all around. And the air was full of doleful voices, 
and the rush of wings. Apparitions against which his trusty sword, with which he had put to flight Apollyon, was of no avail, for they cared not for his sword. And sometimes they brushed against him with such force that he feared they would push him off the path. And he would drop into the depth of hell and be lost forever. These rushings to and fro were heard by him for several miles together till he could go no further and dearly wanted to go back. But then he thought, by now, maybe halfway through the valley, and the danger of going back may be as great as the danger of going forward. So he resolved to go on, and he shouted into the darkness with a vehement voice. I will walk in the strength of the Lord God. And for a while, Silence fell about him once again. But not for long. For now, one of the wicked ones came up behind him and started whispering many base suggestions in his ear. Why don't you... And Christian became so confused, he thought it was his own voice. And he neither knew who he was or where he was. And this grieved poor Christian more than anything he had met with before. Why don't you and he might easily have fallen on his sword and put an end to his misery. At that moment, he thought he heard the voice of a man going before him, saying, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Immediately, Christian took courage, and for three reasons. One, he gathered from this that there were others who feared God in the valley beside himself. Two, he perceived that God was with them, and if with them, why not with him? Three, he hoped to overtake them and have their company. Moreover, day was dawning, and he could look back. And by the light of day, he saw those hobgoblins and dragons of the pit, which had brushed against him in the dark, but all afar off, for after daybreak, they dare not come near. The sunrise brought another benefit for Christian, for Though the first part of the valley was dangerous enough, the second part was, if possible, even more so. From the hillock where he stood, he could see the path ahead that it was cunningly set with pitfalls, traps and secret nets, so that had it been dark, he couldn't have escaped death, even if it had a thousand lives. As it was, he once became entangled in a net, and only his trusty sword could free him. And twice a man-trap, snapping shut beneath him, almost caught his leg. And time and time again, he nearly fell to his destruction, as the ground crumbled under him. Then, just when he believed he was out of the valley, he came across a grisly sight indeed. A pile of skulls and mangled bones lying outside a cave. Even as he stopped to peer within, a sudden hand came out at him. He tried to seize him by the throat. He only just leapt back in time. It seems that once, two giants had lived there, both with a taste for pilgrim's blood. But one 
had now been dead for many years. The other, whose name was Pagan, though he was still alive, was, by reason of his age, grown too stiff in his joints to venture far. He could only bite his nails in frustration at the pilgrims passing by. So Christian came to no more harm and hurried on his way. Then, on the path ahead of him, he saw a man running as if for his life. He recognized him as faithful, his friend and neighbor, the same whom the porter at the palace had informed him of. Ho oh, there! he shouted. Wait till I catch you up! But Faithful only ran the faster, crying, There's an Avenger at my heels! I'm running for my life! He was still half crazy with fear after passing through the valley. In the end, Christian was able to reassure him, and soon they were walking most lovingly together, each telling the other his adventures on the way. So, they made the hours pass easily, which might otherwise have been tedious. Faithful, it seemed, had escaped the slough, but met a wench, whose name was Wanton, who was nearly his undoing. Apollyon, though, he didn't have to fight. How long, dear friend, did you stay in the City of Destruction? Christian asked him, before you set off after me. Till I could bear it no longer, Faithful said, for the townsfolk were all mocking you for seeking to escape. Then, of a sudden, Faithful spied a man on the road ahead. Who's that? he cried, once more consumed with fear. But Christian said, It's my good friend, Evangelist. And so it was. Evangelist had come, as was his wont, to warn them yet again. Don't think you're out of gunshot of the devil. For, as the gospel says, my sons, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you have to pass through many tribulations. He then pointed into the distance. You will soon come to a town, he said. You can see it there before you. It is the town of vanity. And in that town you will have enemies. And then he added, looking fixedly upon them both. Therefore, commit your souls to God and quit yourselves like men, for one of you will die a painful death. With that, Evangelista suddenly departed, and Faithful and Christian were left wondering, which of us two did he mean? There was nothing for it but to go forward and find out. Next time, indeed, we shall tell of the vile treatment received by our two friends in Vanity Fair. And we shall learn which of them, standing trial before Lord Hategood, is condemned to die. On the previous day, after coming out of the Valley of the Shadow of Death, Christian had overtaken his old friend, Faithful. But their joy at meeting 
was not to last for long. They now descended into the town of Vanity. They could hear the sounds of a fair, which is held all the year round. It's called Vanity Fair. Most fairs are merry places, but not this one, not for our travellers. For here, Evangelist had warned them, one of them would meet his death. As in other fairs of less importance, the streets are named after different countries. There's the French row, and the Italian row, and the British row, where the commodities of these countries are sold and promoted. Indeed, there are stalls where every foolish trifle in the world is up for sale. Knick-knacks of gold and silver, baubles and bric-a-brac and precious stones. In addition, you could buy titles and honours and preferments to high office and vain pleasures and empty delights of every kind. While moving busily among the crowds are cheats and rogues and mountebanks. The air is full of fearful oaths and murder, they say, is as common as theft. It is an institution of long standing artfully set up by the Prince of the Demons, Beelzebub himself, in a place through which all who are pilgrims and strangers in this world must pass when going to the Celestial City. Many, it is feared, get no further on their way. As to Christian and Faithful, hoping they would pass unnoticed, they pulled their collars up around their faces. But the rabble were quick to spot them. First, they jeered at them for their outlandish clothes. Then, they jeered at them for their foreign accents. Finally, they asked them angrily, Why aren't you buying our merchandise? Buy, buy, buy. We only buy the truth they said, and put their fingers in their ears, and sought to turn away their eyes from beholding vanity. At that, the townsmen were the more enraged, and the noisiest of hubbubs ensued. News of the hubbub presently reached the Burgomaster. He took the pilgrims to be lunatics, and bade his officers arrest them as disturbers of the peace and take their weapons from them. They were placed in a cage with their feet in the stocks as a public spectacle and made the objects of any man's sport. For their part, they encouraged one another to trust in the Lord and behaved themselves most wisely, giving the passers-by good words for bad. But this further enraged the men of the fair, who now demanded, in loud voices, that an example should be made of one of them, and he should stand trial in court. So a day was appointed, and the chosen prisoner was brought before the judge, the judge was Lord Hategood. The prisoner was faithful. And witnesses were called. Order in court. The first, whose name was Envy, took the oath. Then, pointing his finger at Faithful, he said, 
My lord, I have known this man, Faithful, for a long time. Which was a lie for a start. And notwithstanding his plausible name, he is one of the vilest persons in the country. Superstition was the second witness. For myself, he said, I have no great acquaintance with the prisoner, nor do I desire to know him further. For in my talk with him, he did condemn our laudable religion as a thing of naught. The third witness was a Mr. Pickthank. Oh, my lord, he said, and you gentlemen all, I too have heard this fellow speak things that ought not to be spoke. He spoke contemptuously of our noble prince Beelzebub, and of his honourable friends, Lord Luxury, Lord Lechery, and Sir Havit Greedy. He also railed at you, my lord, who are appointed his judge. He called you, I regret to say, an ungodly villain. It was clear by now that Faithful had been singled out by all three witnesses for their attack. So the judge addressed himself to Faithful. You have heard, sirrah, he said coldly. How these honest gentlemen have witnessed against you. You are, beyond doubt, a vile runagate. Yet, in order that all men may see our gentleness towards you, let us hear what you have to say in your defense. I say then, said Faithful, that in my belief, your laws and religion are flat against the word of God. If you can prove me wrong, then I'm ready to recant. As to Mr. Pickthank's allegations, I abide by what I said. Your prince and his attendants by this gentleman named are fitter to be in hell than in this town. And so, the Lord have mercy on my soul. The judge, in summing up, quoted many learned instances to prove we know not what. Then he called on the jury, all lawful men and true, to consider their verdict. The foreman, Mr. Blindman, said, I clearly see this man to be a heretic. Away with such a fellow, said Mr. No Good. I, said Mr. Malice, for I hate the very looks of him. A sorry scrub, said Mr. High Mind. Hang him! Hang him! said Mr. Heady. Hanging is too good for him, said Mr. Cruelty. So they found him guilty according to their laws. And after manifold indignities, they burnt him at the stake. Thus, Faithful met his end. But, says John Bunyan, the writer of this account, I saw in my dream that behind the crowds there stood a chariot and horses waiting for Faithful, who, as soon as his enemies had done with him, was taken up into it and wafted 
through the clouds to the sound of trumpets. So, in truth, he fared better than his friend, Christian. He would arrive first at the celestial city, and having been faithful unto death, the king would give him the crown of life. Where, all this time, had Christian been? Well, one of the men of the fair, whose name was Hopeful, was much moved by the calm deportment of the pilgrims. And while the people crowded round to see the execution, he succeeded, as sometimes happens in a dream, in spiriting Christian away to safety. And now, Christian and Hopeful travelled on together. Their way took them near the city of fair speech, and four of its untrustworthy citizens came out to salute them, bowing very low. We, too, are going to the celestial city, they said. We, we shall be glad of your company. Hopeful was for joining them, but Christian had heard of their city, that it was a place where money ruled and where religion went in silver slippers. He also recognised one of them as Mr. By-Ends, who had many rich relations. His wife was Lady Feigning's daughter, and he was friend to Mr. Facing both ways and to Mr. Moneylove. So Christian whispered in Hopeful's ear, I like them not as our companions. And making their excuses, they hastened on ahead. A little off the road was a hill called Luca, and from it a gentleman called Demas shouted out to them, Ho! Turn aside! There's a silver mine here! With very little trouble, you'll be rich! Well, let's go and see, said Hopeful, hopefully. Not I, said Christian. I've heard of this place too, that it is dangerous. Not dangerous at all, said Demas, though he blushed with shame as he spoke. So Christian hurried Hopeful past. By now the citizens of fair speech were coming into view. They had no hesitation when Demas beckoned them. They were only too pleased to dig for silver. Oh, <laughs> lead us to the mine, they said. But as they looked greedily over the brink, we are told they lost their footing and fell in and were smothered by the damps that commonly arise. For certain, they were never seen again. As to Christian, though he'd been prudent then, his prudence didn't last, and he was soon to make a terrible mistake. Next time, we shall tell how Christian and Hopeful take a wrong turning and become prisoners in Doubting Castle. And we shall learn whether there is any escape from the hands of giant despair. Faithful, after his noble death in Vanity Fair, had been taken up in a chariot and arrived first at the Celestial City. But Christian was not left to travel on alone. 
he now had Hopeful as his new companion. And he would soon be in dire need of him. The road ahead was very rough, and their feet were very tender with travelling, and they became much discouraged. At this point, Christian espied a stile, which led into a meadow, and seemed to be a short cut. Here's better going, he said. Come, good hopeful, let's climb over it. He, what if it leads us out of our way? asked hopeful. That's not likely, said Christian. Look, there's another man walking ahead of us. So, over the stile they went and Christian was well pleased that the path was easier on his feet. But in leaving the road, he had made a terrible mistake. For soon, night came on, and it grew very dark, and they'd completely lost sight of the pilgrim ahead. Did they but know it, his name was Vain Confidence. Suddenly, they heard in the darkness a shriek, followed by an eerie silence. We'll go no further, said Hopeful in a whisper, clutching at Christian's arm. I would have spoken up before, only you are older than I am. But even as they tried to turn back, it started to rain and lighten and thunder in a very dreadful manner. Where are we now? asked Hopeful, without hope. His companion didn't answer. He was completely lost, for the deluge had caused the waters to rise amain and wash away the path. They were even in great danger of being drowned, had they not found a narrow ledge with an overhanging rock. Here they sheltered as best they could, and waited for the dawn. And being tired out, they fell asleep. <coughs> it was broad daylight, when they were awakened by a grim and surly voice. What are you doing? it said. In my private grounds. Looking up, they saw before them the gloomy figure of giant despair, owner of Doubting Castle, out for his morning walk. We're just poor pilgrims who've lost our way, they said. You're trespassing, said the giant, trampling down my fields. I'll have to teach you. A lesson. They had little to say. They knew they were in the wrong. And since he was stronger than they, they were forced to accompany him. In the light of day, they could now see before them the battlements of Doubting Castle. Here they were cast into a dungeon, dark, and stinking. And here they lay from Wednesday morning till Saturday night without one bite of bread or one drop of water. No one came to visit them. They were cut off from their friends. No one knew where they were. And Christian realized it was all his fault for taking the shortcut and this caused him double sorrow. Now, Giant Despair had a wife. Her name was Diffidence. He never did anything without consulting her. And she was even more malevolent than he was. So, when he was gone to bed, he told her about his prisoners and asked, what shall I do with them? You're too soft-hearted, 
she said. What you must do when you get up in the morning is to beat them without mercy. So, in the morning, he cut himself a grievous cudgel from a crabapple tree in his garden. Then, railing upon his prisoners as if they were dogs, though they had never uttered a word against him, he beat them most fearfully and left them helpless on the floor to spend another day in sighs and lamentations. Next night, the giant was again talking to his wife in bed. What? Are they still alive? She said. They've nothing left to live for. So, when you get up in the morning, you must tell them to make an end of themselves. Up he got, and went to them in a surly manner as before. Your only way out of this place, he said, is by death. So, why are you waiting? Make an end of yourselves. He had thoughtfully provided them with a halter, a knife, and a bottle of poison, so they could have a choice. When they respectfully declined, he looked upon them in a very ugly manner. He would doubtless have killed them himself, but that he fell into one of his fits. For the giant had a secret weakness. On dark and cloudy days, he was as strong as an ox. But in sunshiny weather, he fell into fits. They caused him to lose the use of his hand. And so for a time, he had to withdraw. Then Christian and Hopeful discussed among themselves what they should do. Perhaps the giant is right, said Christian. Perhaps death would be better than the miserable life we lead. Not everything, said Hopeful, is in the hands of giant despair. Who knows? But he may have another of his fits and forget to lock us in. Wait, let us not be our own murderers. In this way, Hopeful moderated the mind of his brother. And so they continued together another day in the dark. Then, night being come, and the giant and his wife being in bed, she asked him again about the prisoners. To which he replied, They are sturdy rogues. They choose to bear all hardships, rather than make away with themselves. Then here's what you must do, she said. Tomorrow morning, take them to the castle yard and show them the bones and skulls of those whom you already have dispatched. Up got the giant once again and took his prisoners into the castle yard as his wife had bidden him. These, he said, pointing to the skeletons, were pilgrims just like you, who trespassed in my grounds. And when I thought fit, I tore them in pieces, as within ten days I will do to you. Back in their dungeon, Christian nearly swooned away. For now, through lack of food and by reason of his stripes, he could hardly breathe. But Hopeful again encouraged him. My brother, he said, Apollyon couldn't crush you, nor the valley of the shadow of death. And remember how you played the man in Vanity Fair. And don't forget, the old giant has wounded me as well as you. So, 
let's bear up with patience and keep on praying. Then, as often happens in dreams, when things are desperate, Christian suddenly remembered. I have in my pocket, he said, an old key called Promise. It might just fit the lock. Why try it? said Hopeful. It was the middle of the night when Diffidence sat up in bed and roused her husband. Perhaps, she said, they have pick locks with them. That's why they live in hope. Says thou so, my dear, said the giant despair. I'll search them in the morning. That's time enough. <laughs> Even now, Christian was trying the dungeon door with his key. The lock went damnable hard. Weak as he was, he had to work at it. But at last the key began to turn. There was a creaking and a groaning and the door swung open and in came the light of dawn. <laughs> What's that noise? said the giant, waking with a start. Better go and see, my dear, said his wife. Christian and Hopeful had run through the door only to be confronted by a new obstacle. A heavy iron gate. Wait, try the key again, said Hopeful. Christian tried it, and it worked. <laughs> then the giant was upon them. Nothing can save us now, cried Christian. All is lost. <laughs> no sooner had the giant come into the light of the sun than he had another of his fits. His limbs failed him. His legs gave way. And Christian and Hopeful were quickly out of the castle grounds and out of the giant's jurisdiction. At the place where they had gone astray, they now put up a notice. Over this stile is the way to Doubting Castle. All trespassers will be destroyed. Take warning. That done, they continued in safety on the King's Highway. But not, I fear, for very long. Next time, we shall tell how our friends ignore some good advice and how the dark river lies between them and the celestial city. And we shall learn what fear possesses Christian because he cannot swim. Christian and his new friend, Hopeful, after trespassing in the grounds of giant despair, had been lucky to escape from Doubting Castle. They surely wouldn't be so foolish as to stray from the road again. For they'd now reached the delectable mountains. And what a pleasant change was here. After the squalor of the giant's prison, they were able to wash themselves in clear streams and to eat freely the fruit of the orchards. Next, they were met by a party of shepherds feeding their flocks, who led them most lovingly 
to a topmost peak. From here, they said, is your first glimpse of the celestial city. If you have the skill to look through our perspective glass. They looked and thought they saw what might have been a golden gate. And then, as they stood leaning on their staffs, the way that weary pilgrims do, the shepherds gave them these two warnings. One, beware of the flatterer. Two, take heed of the enchanted ground. With that, they sent them on their way. Now, from a crooked lane ahead of them, appeared a brisk young lad. His name was Ignorance. He'd set out that morning from the country of Conceit to walk to the Celestial City. Have you your parchment? Christian asked. Oh no, <laughs> I shan't need that, said Ignorance. I couldn't be expected to go all the way back for it. But what have you got to show? at the gate. Gentlemen, you are utter strangers to me. Be content to practice your religion, and I will practice mine. <laughs> I'm sure all will be well. <laughs> he clearly wouldn't listen to any advice, so they left the lad to follow on, behind. Arriving at a place where two ways met, they were wondering which way to go, when behold a man, dressed in white, came up to them. They supposed he was one of the shining ones. Hearing they were bound for heaven's gate, he said to them, most civilly, I'm going there myself, so follow me. But the road kept bending round and round, till presently they found themselves with the city quite behind them. This can't be right, they said, and tried to stop. But all too late, for they had got entangled in a net they hadn't seen, drawn across their path. And the more they tried to free themselves, <laughs> the more enmeshed did they become? As to the man in white, he'd thrown off his robe and was revealed for what he was, a being of malign intent, who mockingly abandoned them. <laughs> they might have languished there all day, had not a real shining one appeared and cut the net and set them free. Did no one warn you against the flatterer? The angel asked. The shepherds did, said Christian. But we never thought that this fine-spoken man was he. They were back on their right road again, with ignorance still following behind, when yet another traveller was seen, coming to meet them. His name was Atheist, and when he heard where they were going, he broke into loud laughter. <laughs> What's the meaning of your laughter? Christian asked. I've been looking for this city, he remarked, for twenty years. There's no such place. Heaven does not exist. So saying, he swept past them on his way. <laughs> but they knew better, having lately seen the city through the shepherd's telescope. And then as they were passing through a veil 
a gradual weariness assailed their limbs. The air was heavy, as before a storm, and they grew very drowsy. I can hardly keep my eyes open, said Hopeful to his fellow. Let's stop and take a nap, for sleep is sweet to the labouring man, and we may wake refreshed. Equally, said Christian, we may never wake again, for this, methinks, is the enchanted ground of which the shepherds warned us. Poor Hopeful looked aghast at being so unwise. He had I been here alone, he said, I might have met my death. For now indeed, it felt as if someone had cast a spell on them. But they were not to be ensnared a second time. Oh, we'll keep ourselves awake by good discourse, oh, said Christian, stifling a yawn. And talking all the while, they forced their feet along, and so made their escape. They entered now a country where the air was sweet again. The flowers grew, the birds all sang, and the sun shone night and day. For this was the land of Beulah, where the shining ones commonly walked, and it lay upon the frontier of heaven. There was a perfect view of the celestial city, a city founded higher than the clouds, its walls and towers shining in the sun, so dazzling that the pilgrims had to look at it through clouded glass until their eyes grew more accustomed to the light. Then, just as they imagined they were safely there, they all at once stood still, quite stunned by what they saw. For between them and the city gate flowed a deep, dark river, over which a mist forever swirled. They looked to the left, and they looked to the right, but the men on the bank said, <laughs> You have to go through it. There is no bridge. It was a fearful moment, for Christian couldn't swim. Yet after coming all that way, he mustn't falter now. He stepped into the river, trembling, and immediately began to sink, and shouted to his good friend, Hopeful! <gasps> Hopeful, the waves are swallowing me up. Hopeful tried to keep his head above water, but the river was so deep that Christian sank again. He was more frightened now than he had ever been, even in the valley of the shadow. A great darkness and horror fell upon him. This was the river of death, and he feared he was drowning in it. But the troubles a man goes through in these waters are no sign that God has forsaken him. And all at once, the sun was visible through the mist. The pilgrims felt new strength within themselves. The water became less deep. The ground was firmer underfoot. And so they reached the shore. Meanwhile, what of ignorance, who was never far behind? He got over without half the difficulty of the others, and didn't even wet his shoes. For he had met a somewhat dubious ferryman, called Vain Hope, who ferried him across. Upon the farther bank, two men in shining clothes were standing to receive our friends. 
It's you, it's you they wait for, said Christian to Hopeful. You have been hopeful ever since I knew you. Why, and so have you, said he to Christian. But no one was there to welcome ignorance. He had to climb the path alone. Then, as the pilgrims neared the gate, the whole of the heavenly host must have known of their arrival, for they were greeted by the king's own trumpeters, who made all heaven echo with their sound. But when ignorance knocked to be admitted, the men above the gate looked down on him and said, Where is your parchment roll, my friend, to prove that you have come by the right road? He fumbled in his coat, but having nothing, as we know, stood silent underneath their gaze and sorrowfully turned back. The pilgrims, on the other hand, each had their parchments ready, and a voice cried out, These pilgrims now are come from the city of destruction for the love they bear to the king of this place. So the gates of heaven opened to them, and they entered in. And, writes Bunyan in his book, I was able to look in after them. I saw the streets were paved with gold, and in them walked, with crowns upon their heads, the company of just men, made perfect. And the bells of the city rang for joy, for Christian and his fellow had come to their true home. And after that, they shut the gates, and I awoke, and behold, it was a dream.